Advocacy Conference. My name is Rodney D. Pierce. I'm a Javis Frazier scholar, and I am a government history teacher in Nash County Public Schools in North Carolina. And today's session is entitled, A Lesson from History, Importance of a Big Tent, Philosophical Diversity Toward a Shared Goal. So why are we here? We are here, ladies and gentlemen, because of the data. And that data is that Black, Latino, and Indigenous students, low-income students, and students with disabilities are underrepresented in advanced programs and courses. Just over one in 20 low-income Black and Indigenous students participate in advanced placement courses. Black students are half as likely as white students to take Algebra one in eighth grade. A low-income student with reading and math achievement levels equal to those of a high-income student is half as likely to receive gifted services as the high-income student. And students living in poverty from minority backgrounds and English learners are 250 times less likely to be identified and served in gifted programs despite performing at the same high levels as their other peers. We are here because of the data. And we are here to learn to be advocates so we can change that data so that it's more equitable and more just. And we're gonna follow the example of this gentleman to learn how to do it. Is this the land of the free and the home of the brave? Oh. Is this a land with liberty and justice for all? Oh. Is this one nation indivisible under God? No. Either let us practice the democracy we are preaching or shut up. You will leave. Now, who might that be? I don't know if you know or not. Like I said before, we are here to learn from this man's example so we can change this data. It's been 50 years, ladies and gentlemen, 50 years since Jacob, over 50 years, since Jacob Javits sponsored the Gifted and Talented Educational Assistance Act, the first ever type of federal legislation geared toward gifted education. And we have data like this. So we're gonna follow this man's example. Who is this? This is the incomparable, honorable Reverend Adam Clayton Powell Jr., the longtime pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, New York, and the congressman for Harlem from 1945 to 1971. And from 1961 to 1967, he was the chairman of the United States House Ed Committee on Education and Labor which at that time made him the most powerful black man in the country. I have a question I ask my students sometimes is, who's the most powerful African-American politician in the history of the United States? And they'll quickly say, like you would probably say, President Obama. And I say, okay, well, who was it before him? And they usually can't answer. Without Adam Clayton Powell Jr., you don't have a Barack Obama. And you're gonna see how they're Career arcs are kind of similar. And then at the bottom, I have Adam's campaign motto. Keep the faith, baby. If you remember from his video, he was saying, he was reciting lines from the Pledge of Allegiance. How can I pledge allegiance to a country that doesn't pledge allegiance to me by making sure that there's liberty and justice for all, that this is the land of the free and the home of the brave? you know, things of that nature. And if we have these racial inequities and these inequities based on economics or economic background and gifted education, then we're, we do not have a country that is pledging, pledging allegiance to us. Now, I told you that Powell was the chairman of the House Education and Labor Committee. So I'm gonna share with you just some notable legislation and programs that were either authorized by him or passed through his committee prior to becoming law. And most of these are self-explanatory. National Education Improvement Act, Higher Education Facilities Act, which put more money towards improving and building colleges and universities, the Vocational Education Act, the Health Professionals Education Assistance Act of 1963, 
the Library Services and Construction Act for building more public libraries, the Nurses Training Act for putting more money aside so that young men and young ladies could go to school to become nurses, the National Vocational Student Loan Insurance Act, so the student loan program, it's Adam Clayton Powell. And then was probably the most significant piece of legislation that ever came through his committee, or one of the most significant, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which increased the federal government's commitment towards public education, K through 12 public education specifically. That's how you get your Title I program, for those of us who work in Title I schools. And then the Higher Education Act in the same year. Now, the Jacob Javits Gifted and Talented Student Education Act was passed in 1988 during the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So do you have a Jacob Javits Gifted and Talented Student Education Act without Adam Clayton Powell? And we know that one of our federal, federal advocacy efforts is to get the Higher Education Act reauthorized. And when we do get it reauthorized, help Congress to learn, to understand that any federal education bills must address gifted education. Any bill must address it. So again, do we have gifted education in public ed without Adam Clayton Powell? His committee kind of makes the way for Jacob Javits to introduce that bill that becomes law. And look at these programs. Anybody in here did work study when you were in college? Or did you take out student loans? Does anyone in your family use Medicare or Medicaid? Did you or anyone you know go through Head Start or Upward Bound, or Job Corps or Manpower? Have you ever received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities? The National Council on the Arts? Increased Minimum Wage, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, Adam Clayton Powell. Either came out of his committee or he had his hand in him. How did he do this? How did Adam pull all this off? How did Congressman Powell pull all this off? Three things are what we're going to focus on today. First, he had a proven track record of activism. Second, he had a maverick personality. Third, he knew his audience. Congressman Powell operated under this doctrine of pragmatic realism with that. And pragmatic realism says that no knowledge comes to you unless you act. Knowledge comes by way of action. So you can't stand on the sidelines and watch and observe. You have to be, get involved. And that's why we're here. We already want to be involved or we're already involved. We're just learning or want to learn how to be more effective. So his proven track record of activism, when Adam graduated from college, he became the assistant pastor of his father's church, Adam Clayton Powell Sr., Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, and became the director of the community house, which was the community relief program that operated through the church. There was a relief kitchen through there. There was clothing distribution. Adam would even give his own clothes and shoes sometimes to people. People received unemployment relief. If they came to the church and were willing to work at the church in this community house, they got paid for it. There was also a job referral agency. There were adult education classes offered, which eventually was subsidized by the Workers' Progress Administration through the New Deal. There was a nursery for preschool students whose parents were out looking for jobs. There was a mental health clinic. There was a Big Brothers program. This Big Brothers program allowed adults to supervise youth in recreational activities such as basketball and track, young ladies and young men. They also had a boxing club through the Big Brothers program. There was a Young Thinkers program, which involved lectures and debates and symposiums on topics that were important to the youth of the church. There was a youth council where they were able to bring to the attention of the church topics that were important to them. The Pioneers Council was for the elementary and middle school students. And then you had the Crusader Council, which was for the high schoolers and collegiate kids. And Adam had an open door policy with these youth programs. 
You didn't have to be a member of Abyssinian in order to be a part of it. They also had Philharmonic Glee Club and youth choirs. So these kids who were in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, were singing in the church choir. And what this did was it increased church membership because these youth who were not members of the church became members of the church. And guess what? They brought their families with them. So Adam enmeshed himself into the community through the church, helping the adults and particularly the youth. Furthermore, his proven track record of activism extended into the community even more through social activism. Now, when Adam came to the church in the capacity that we're talking about, it was the Great Depression. And so black people in Harlem were in this perpetual state of unemployment and poverty. And so Adam associated with all of these different groups and created his own, the Greater New York Coordinating Committee, to address these issues. So there were pickets, there were boycotts, there were protests against white-owned businesses on 125th Street to hire black people, Harlem Hospital to hire more black doctors and to promote them and to also hire more black nurses so that the black nurses that they had wouldn't be bogged down with the workload. Also to desegregate their facilities in terms of the cafeteria, the 1939 World Fair, to hire more black workers. Not only were they going after the central administration, but they were also going to the individual exhibits and telling them to hire more black workers or boycotting the products that were promoted through those individual exhibits. There were rent strikes. As you can see right here on Adam's poster that he's wearing around his neck, you know, why pay higher rents when taxes have been reduced? So they were about tenant rights. They had a tenant's league. There were uh, utility strikes against Consolidated Edison Gas and Electric Company and the New York Telephone Company, which had no black operators out of, I think, about 3,000. Again, hire black workers. The black workers you have, promote them so you can hire more black workers. These are the things Adam and his cohorts and were pushing for. Then there was the bus boycott 20 plus years before Dr. King and Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama, where people in Harlem boycotted the New York City Omnibus Corporation and the Fifth Avenue Coach Company, which were the public transportation companies. I believe that boycott lasted from October of 1941 to April of 1942. We need drivers and mechanics. We don't just need porters in, in menial positions. We need drivers and mechanics, positions that are really going to make our people money so they can take better care of themselves and their families. So this is that proven track record of activism. This is that pragmatic realism from Congressman Powell. Get involved, get involved. Now this is Congressman Powell's maverick personality. Congressman Powell is a Democrat. Dwight Eisenhower is a Republican, right? But Powell defied his party and broke ranks in 1956 and supported Republican President Dwight Eisenhower for re-election, saying that the Democratic Party's platform on civil rights was too weak. Why would he support Ike? I'm glad you asked. Ike sent in the 101st Airborne to enforce a federal court order during desegregation in Arkansas. You ever heard of the Little Rock Nine? those nine high school students, Ike sent those troops in to escort them to class. While Harry Truman issued the executive order to desegregate the military, Eisenhower, a former general himself, actually enforced it. He desegregated the Veterans Administration and military bases in the South. And he desegregated public facilities in DC. He and his wife, I believe, refused to go to them if they were segregated. So Ike had a little credibility, just like Adam had credibility through his social activism, through his community work, through the church. Eisenhower had credibility, which Powell threw his weight behind because he felt like the campaign of Adlai Stevenson, who was a Democratic presidential candidate, who he had actually supported in 1952, was too weak when it came to civil rights. So we have to be independent when the time comes and we have to step out from amongst the crowd and support those causes 
of which we have a conviction and a sincerity to. Here's another example of Powell's Maverick personality. In 1955, against the wishes of the U.S. State Department, Powell attended the Bandung Conference in Indonesia, which was the first large-scale conference between newly independent African and Asian nations. Nearly 30 countries attended this conference. I'm going to play this video here for you. Out of the 3 billion people in the world today, 2 billion 500 million are colored. And these colored people are saying, don't talk to us about a free world. And don't talk to us about following your leadership as long as you've got our colored people in Cambridge, Maryland, not able to buy a cup of coffee in a cheap little lunch counter. In 1955, Powell defied a U.S. government boycott to become the only American representative at the first conference of third world nations in Bandung, Indonesia. He traveled at his own expense. These are colored peoples, two billion of them represented here. But surprisingly, it's not anti-white, it's not anti-American, but it most definitely is anti-American foreign policy. He confounded expectations by defending U.S. progress in race relations and by blocking a Chinese effort to have the conference condemn America for its racism. A startled but elated Congress hailed him with a special resolution. The veterans of foreign wars named him their man of the year. And an embarrassed State Department called him in for a special debriefing session. They had had no representative at the conference. Elway and Paul... So Powell goes to the Bangdong conference, and when the conference attendees are ready to condemn America for its racism, he says, ho, ho, wait up, wait a minute. I am an example of America's improving race relations. And as a matter of fact, you guys have racial discrimination in your own countries, right? India with the untouchables, the different caste system, the different classes in the caste system. So he points to himself as an example of improving race relations. And when he gets back to America, he's lauded and criticized in, in different press outlets. But the State Department is happy. It's very happy. The veterans of foreign wars, as you saw in the video, name him their man of the year. And one of the things I don't talk about in this is when we get into the Cold War, Adam suggest to the State Department to use jazz artists like Dizzy Gillespie, Duke Ellington, to go to these quote unquote third world countries to improve relations with them so that they get more so on the side of the United States as opposed to the Soviets. So Adam Powell was, was a maverick. You know, he was one of the few, if not the only congressman who talked about the, the importance of the United States supporting these newly independent nations like Sierra Leone, uh, Ghana, Nigeria. He would say that on the floor of Congress. The last example of his maverick personality, beginning in 1946 until 1965, Powell attached an amendment to every appropriation bill to deny federal funds to racially segregated jurisdictions. It became known as the Powell Amendment and was eventually incorporated into Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, while the Powell Amendment was primarily used to deny funds to segregated schools, so it was basically about education legislation, Powell actually used it to temporarily block Eisenhower's expansion of the National Guard in states whose units were segregated. Now, that still passed and went through. Eisenhower was like, you're compromising national security. And... Powell was like, no, you know, again, that conviction, that sincerity, I'm willing to take the shots. I'm willing to take the lumps to go along with this. I know it's not popular, but it's right. As a matter of fact, when he was on the Education and Labor Committee before he became chairman, uh, it was reportedly he got punched by a congressman from West Virginia, Cleveland Bailey, because Bailey said, you're trying to destroy, destroy the public school system. 
with your Powell Amendment. So you might have to take some shots when you stand out there independently as a maverick. Whenever a person keeps prodding, whenever a person keeps them squirming, whenever a person is an irritant, it serves a purpose. It may not in the contemporary history uh, look so good, but uh, as the times roll on, uh, future historians will say they served a purpose. He continued to insist, for example, uh, on putting an amendment on every piece of social legislation that uh, it not be used for segregated services. It was called the Powell Amendment, and it denied funds to any state which segregated its facilities. In the face of Southern congressional power, the amendment caused the defeat of federal aid to education and other social legislation. Then people would deride it. Editorials in the New York Times, editorials all over the place. Why does that involve getting the way of all this social legislation? The liberals hated him for it. I feel it was uh, fundamentally uh, an act of demagoguery because it did not advance the cause. It gave him an opportunity to make speeches. Uh, I, under I could understand from his point of view why he would do it, but he knew full well that his offering that amendment would ensure the death of, of uh, federal aid education. So he had an issue that he could keep alive, but he didn't do much to advance the cause of better schooling for the people of the country, including the children of his own district. And we probably were not. So you see the criticism he took from one of his congressional colleagues. And you heard the gentleman talk about how liberals, liberals would deride him because they sometimes they would eventually have to vote against the legislation because he would embarrass them. So again, when you are a maverick, you know, when you have a sincerity and a conviction about an issue like we do about gifted education, we have to be willing to step outside the box and be independent when it comes to this issue of gifted education because we're right and in the end game, in the long game, we end up winning. How did he win? Because what he did starting in the mid forties eventually became part of the Civil Rights Act in the mid sixties, 1964. So what do we have so far? We have his proven track record of activism with the pragmatic realism, getting involved, not standing on the sidelines. And we have this maverick personality where he breaks party ranks to support Eisenhower. He goes to the Bandung Conference and his power will limit. Thirdly, he knew his audience. So as an activist in Harlem, Powell excelled at either leading or joining social movements that were different in terms of race, political ideology or philosophy, occupation, religious beliefs, et cetera. He worked with various municipal, civic, religious, business, and political leaders and organizations, including the communists, the socialists, the NAACP, the Black Nationalists, the UNIA, which would be the Universal Negro Improvement Association started by Marcus Garvey, and a host of other organizations or people. And so while he used the church to do nonviolent picketing protest, the tactics of his allies may have been a little more physical or violent. But the end goal, the goals were eventually, were generally the same. So again, we have this big tent. We have all these different various groups working toward the same aim. We have this philosophical diversity. We have different ideologies when it comes to politics, when it comes to race, when it comes to um, religion. But we all want the same thing. We all want the same thing. This is a lesson from history, ladies and gentlemen, about how we can follow his example to do the very thing we want to do, which is to achieve more equity in gifted education. Again, he knew his audience. He knew when not to compromise, such as the Powell Amendment, and he knew when to compromise. When early in his career, he sponsored the Fair Employment Practice Commission bill. Check this out now. This bill was going to end discrimination or would have ended discrimination in employment for reasons of race, color, or creed. So this bill got held up in committee for four years, obviously, right? This is early in Powell's career in the, in the 40s. So he selects a, um, excuse me, he selected to chair a special subcommittee on the bill in 1950. Now, a lot of people thought the bill was communist inspired. So to quell that rhetoric, Powell personally chooses then Congressman Richard Milhouse Nixon 
to serve on the subcommittee. Tricky Dick himself. So Powell must have saw something in him, I guess. But ironically, Nixon votes against the bill in subcommittee, which defeats it. But again, Powell was willing to compromise. Hey, you think my bill is, is communist inspired? You think it's not a good bill? I'll put one of the other party's people on this committee to help us get it right so that it'll pass. And this person I chose still uh, voted against the bill. So sometimes when we know our audience and when we know when to compromise and when not to, we may still lose in the, in the short run. But prayerfully and hopefully we're setting ourselves up to win in the long run. Again, he knew his audience. He was particularly shrewd when he ensured that he would become the chairman of the House Education and Labor Committee. He originally threw his support behind LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, the master of the Senate, before he switched to John F. Kennedy following the Democratic Convention. He even campaigned for Kennedy in Harlem along with Eleanor Roosevelt. In the end, Powell got what he wanted. This is a clip from the movie Keep the Faith, Baby, uh, which is on YouTube, which is about Powell's life. You can watch it yourself for free on YouTube. This is a meeting between Powell, who's right here, Ray Jones, who's one of his chief aides, Sam Rayburn, who was the Speaker of the House from Texas, and LBJ, U.S. Senator from Texas. Now, Adam, I don't care what presidential candidate Symington and Kennedy come around selling. Lyndon here is going to be the man to be. You just tell Speaker Sam what you want for your backing and he'll let you know what's possible. My seniority, protected from the Dixocrats and the Republicans. Done. And I want the chairmanship of the Education and Labor Committee. You should rightfully have what is rightfully yours, according to seniority. I will support that fully. Mr. Jones? The best way to go about this is quietly. I will deliver on behalf of Congressman Powell and myself at least half the delegate votes that Senator Johnson will get on the first ballot. If he wins the presidential nomination, we will throw our full support behind him. If not, we must be free to do what's best for the party. Your reputation is well earned, Mr. Jones. No matter who ends up being the Democratic nominee, Congressman Powell will get full Democratic support for the education and labor chairmanship, which he rightfully deserves. Deal. But as I promised my father, I had to remain independent. Well, are you ready? We're born ready, right? Bobby, right. I'm Congressman C. Bobby, baby. <laughs> Off your cigar? Thanks. They smoke half my stash. I'm going to give it to him anyway. <laughs> I think it's brilliant what you boys are doing with Jack's campaign. Any chance of getting Sinatra and Sammy up here to help me campaign in Holland? <laughs> we'll see what I can do. <laughs> well, Bobby, as we discussed earlier, and Adam agrees with me, the only way we're going to get an Irish Catholic into the White House is if the base of the Democratic Party comes together. That's right, but uh, just one question, Congressman. Why did you ask the other Negro delegates not to support Jack at the convention? Jack accepted the support of the segregationist governor, John Patterson from Alabama. He refused to vote to Senator Joe McCarthy. He's got a lousy record on civil rights. Now you boys beat Lyndon Johnson for the Democratic nomination, but there's no way you're going to beat Nixon for the presidency if I don't help. I guarantee it. So if we can work something out, maybe Jack can become president after all. Well, it depends on what you want, Congressman. First topic is the Education and Labor Committee chairmanship. 
But I'm chair, I don't want any interference with my authority or my seniority. I want Jack to back me. And second, you and your brother are going to have to change your ways on civil rights and the Negro. Well, Bobby, what about it? I don't know. I'll have to take that back to Jack. But I'll tell you one thing. Jack Kennedy, he'll be a lot better for the Negro people than Nixon. Well, he's got to get elected first. Martin Luther King says that he's... So you see, the backroom dealing and politicking, but he got what he wanted. He got what he wanted. He became the chairman of the Education and Labor Committee, making him one of the most powerful politicians in the country. And what I particularly like is he, he was able to justify, I guess you could say, why he didn't initially support Kennedy by Kennedy's shoddy record on civil rights. And uh, if we know history, we know it took the Kennedy brothers a little time to come around on civil rights. They were uh, men of privilege. Again, he knew his audience. This is Chairman Powell, who was highly effective as the chairman of the US House Committee on Education and Labor, pushing through the legislation of President Kennedy's New Frontier and President Johnson's Great Society programs. No chairman on the Hill held more hearings than Chairman Powell. He was like a prosecutor stacking evidence to support the legislation that came out of his committee. This man had hearings with people from the entertainment industry, with people from historically black colleges and universities, with juvenile delinquents who would talk to him about being homeless, living on the street, selling drugs, all of these things to justify and build support for the legislation coming out of his committee. And he appropriately delegated committee assignments. So if someone was um, good when it came to education, that was the subcommittee that they chaired. If they were good when it came to the arts, that was the subcommittee that they chaired. You know, whatever they were good or what their passion was. Juvenile delinquency is your passion. That's the subcommittee you're going to chair. Vocational ed is your passion. That's the subcommittee you're going to chair. He doubled the budget. He empowered these people. So when we know our audience, when we know how to maneuver, you know, and we get this big tent with all of these people, with these philosophical diversities, but we're going towards that same goal, we need to find out what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are. I'm good in this, so I'm going to do this. You're good in this, so you're going to do that. By that, we empower each other and we strengthen our resolve. 49 bills, ladies and gentlemen. 49 bills that came out of the Education and Labor Committee became law within his first five years as chair. Gentlemen, I've been waiting for the last 15 minutes for all of you to arrive. My expectations are simple. We don't come late. We work as long and as hard as we have to to get bills drafted and passed. Quickly. Now let's get to work. It's now 15 minutes after the hour. The meeting will officially come to order. I doubled everything of my predecessor, Graham Barton, and his staff. Give me that hammer, young blood. Graham Barton believed the earth and flat and the sun do move. I double the meetings, budget requests, and more than quadruple those results. Come on, baby, keep moving. Time's a waste. One 14-month period, I was responsible for the passage of 14 bills. Now that is a record that no chairman in the history of the United States Congress has before or since achieved. In the six years I was committee chairman, I never lost one bill once I reached the House floor. That's why it was important I keep getting reelected. Congress operates by seniority, relationships, experience. It takes years to acquire all three. So the woman says, I thought you were a man of the claw. I said, I am, baby. Silk. <laughs> I'll see you probably later. Thanks, I appreciate the vote. Over time, I was able to maneuver even my worst enemies. I was most proud of taking Congress to the streets of Harlem. He's your hometown city. The monkey took the buzz about that. The eyes said your story is so touching. Sounds like a lie. All cameras will have to stop. The meeting will officially come to order. What got me was how, over time, eventually my most reluctant colleagues learned to like it. This is about Now, not only was Powell 
effective as a chairman when it came to passing legislation. He always was effective in how he operated his committee. Obviously, he was, right? But what I was trying to say is he was smart enough to know because he had gained such a reputation and, you know, which, which pissed a lot of his colleagues off. Um, he would keep his name off of bills so that they would have a greater likelihood of passing. And, you know, so he didn't care who got the credit. He cared, but he didn't care. And if we're getting more equity and gifted education, we shouldn't care who gets the credit either. But he also knew when to hold bills up so he could get what he needed or what he wanted. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act was held up because Powell wanted a $440,000 appropriation for operating expenses. LBJ called him up and cussed him out. There's a video of that on YouTube. I was going to use it in a presentation, but I decided not to. But he held it up. And until Powell got his money because Johnson convinced the House to give it to him, that's when the bill eventually worked its way through committee to the floor. He also held up the Economic Opportunity Act, which is what I believe you get uh, upward bound out of. He held that up for four months till he got what he wanted. Knew his audience. These are all brilliant men to me that we see here. Powell's with all of them. We have on the left, on the top, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Brother Minister Malcolm X, a fiery orator, unapologetic in speaking of the conditions of African Americans in America. We have in the middle, on the top, in the on, up top, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., himself a Baptist minister, much like Powell. And then on the right at the top, we have Stokely Carmichael, who became the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was actually founded in my state, North Carolina, at the HBCU, Shaw University. Uh, Stokely became Kwame Ture and um, became the prime minister of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and advocated a position of black power. Then at the bottom, you have the presidents. We have Kennedy on the right, and we have Johnson on the left. Powell worked or sat with all of these men, all of them. It was a way of not only keeping himself relevant, but also working further towards the cause. All these men did not have the same approach when it came to the goals that they all had, civil rights in particular. And we can say gifted education is a civil right because we're talking about the racial inequity of it. And Powell was known as Mr. Civil Rights. But look, he's with all of them. He's with all of them. They all respected him. He knew his audience. He knew his audience. He knew how to use these gentlemen to achieve his goals of staying relevant and of further promoting the laws and the legislation he was trying to promote and get passed. And in turn, they did the same with him, right? So it didn't matter that you were fiery like Malcolm and aggressive or passive like Martin, that you were the diplomat like LBJ or the upstart like Kennedy or the radical and militant like Stokely or Kwame. Power worked with you. So in closing, ladies and gentlemen, Powell, a proven track record of activism. What are you doing in your local community? You're an advocate, right? Okay, but what do you have to show for? What does your resume look like? Are you part of any local organizations? Do you sit on the boards of any local nonprofits to earn your credibility, to earn your track record of activism? What are you doing so that when you go to the people, when you go to those other parents, those other people in the community, those businesses, to ask them for assistance, and promoting gifted education. Hey, we want to take this trip or we want to do this project with our students. Can you help us finance it? Working with your Chamber of Commerce, for example. You're going to have to have that proven track record in order to get their cooperation. Are you a member of your PTA or PTO? You have to have that Maverick personality to be independent when necessary, independent when necessary, 
standing on your own, standing on your own convictions and sincerity to be a proponent of this cause of racial equity and gifted education. And know your audience when you're dealing with these legislators. You know, know that you need to be able to approach them individually and in mass. But they have a story. They use stories to, to get us to vote for them or to get their colleagues to vote for certain types of legislation. Always approach them with the story. Always tell them thank you. Make those office visits. Send those letters. Send those emails. And who is Powell with right here? None other than Jacob Javits. Did you know they supported each other? They both were congressmen from New York. Javis actually became the attorney general of New York and the U.S. senator from New York. But they supported each other. Isn't that, isn't that odd? Isn't that ironic? Jacob Javits, the original proponent of gifted education, one of the federal advocacy efforts that we have is to put more money into the Jacob Javits Gifted and Talented Student Education Act. And here he is with Congressman Powell, his homeboy from New York. Jacob Javits would attach amendments to bills to, get, to not support things with federal funds that were racially segregated. He was Jewish. He knew about discrimination and persecution from an ethnic or racial point of view, just like Powell did as an African-American man. And then, you know, we, we have these federal advocacy efforts when it comes to the Higher Education Act to make sure that any federal legislation includes gifted education. Remember that came out of Powell's committee? We have the Jacob Javits Gifted and Talented Students Education Act, which funds our grant program. We want more money in that. You don't get that without the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1988. Then we have the Advanced Coursework Equity Act that was introduced in 2019 by Senator Booker, another congressman from the Northeast, excuse me, another member of Congress from the Northeast that's gonna put 800 mil into advanced coursework and equity measures and gifted ed. And so we have all these goals and these are ways that we can go about achieving them. Reaching across those different aisles, bringing in that big tent of different people from different arenas, having those philosophical diversities or differences, or dis but still working toward that same shared goal of equity in gifted education. And I just think it's very, very ironic, and this is why I used him, that Congressman Powell is not only tied to Jacob Javits, but is tied to a lot of the things that we are doing in gifted education and that we want to achieve in gifted education. He literally, to me, paved the way for Jacob Javits to do what he did in introducing the gifted and talented, <clears throat> excuse me, gifted and talented educational assistance act, 1969. Keep the faith, baby. Thank you.